Welcome to A Seat at the Table, a podcast for public service professionals by public service professionals. This podcast series is presented by Statewide Learning Services, a division of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. In this episode, your host, Tanisha Haynes, invites performance strategist and frequent guest facilitator, Linda Clark, to explore the topic of shining the light on scary places, a discussion on showing people how to face uncertainty. So please, won't you take your seat at the table? Welcome, everyone. I am so excited about this episode. Uh, Linda Clark is fast becoming like one of my most favorite people ever. She has had such a great influence on me, such a great influence on our team at Statewide Learning Services, and we wanted to take this opportunity to come and share her with the rest of all of you. Um, So welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for taking out the time to come and join us and participate in this conversation. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm excited and nervous, but we'll count that since we're talking about uncertainty today. But thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to work with your team here at the state. Thank you so much. Um, Let's just jump right in because I'm sure we could talk for hours and have so many different topics that we can discuss. For the most part, what we're talking about is shining in the darkness of addressing the dark places, dealing with the difficult things and Of course, uncertainty, which is the word of the year. Talk to me about what your work is and how that connects to those things. Well, just start with a nice softball question there, why don't you? (laughs) So the majority of my work is around liberating curiosity and confidence in people. For a long time, I struggled because people would go, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I publicly speak. I facilitate. I train. I am a you know part-time professor. And it sounded like I just couldn't make a decision about what I do. And then I realized that what I do through coaching, that what I do through working with teams like yours, you created the magic. My job is to create structure for you to explore in, right? Safety for you to explore in, empathy for what exploration looks and feels like. So that's what I do. That's fantastic. And it's effective. If you guys have not participated or um, been able to sit in on one of Linda's webinars or participate in something that she's facilitating in, she does a very excellent job of creating that structure. What does that look like right now in helping people face uncertainty? What have you found in your work during this time? So what I've seen is the empathy that we knew we needed and that we were working on slowly has come boiling to the front. It is the priority right now that you cannot lead by authority. You cannot lead by force. You cannot lead by shame. And I'm seeing all of these behaviors, but the leaders that are leading with empathy right now are succeeding. The organizations that are modeling empathy and not just talking about it are leading. Absolutely. I think that we've looked at empathy as being a soft word, a a word of emotion that you know, doesn't belong in the workplace. And I agree with you that those people and those places, those organizations and those leaders that are really digging in and doing the hard work of empathy are succeeding and excelling because in uncertainty, it's necessary. Uncertainty takes us to a dark place. Uncertainty means failure. Talk to me about failure and what you're seeing kind of in your work, uh, what you've seen in the past uh, coming from an HR background, how does failure play a role? You know, I think it's understanding failure as a path to innovation and then understanding that what we want from people is not that they're perfect because it doesn't exist and not that they never fail because they will if they're trying hard enough. It's the resilience of Can you stand back up when you fail? Am I there for you when you fall, right? It's all great and good for me to say it's okay to fail, but then when you do, if I distance myself and go, oh, I see over there you have failed, how unfortunate for you, but I'm going to stay over here. Right. Um, One of the most remarkable examples of empathy I've had in the last few months is I took a major fall off of my horse in April, and 
Falls an understatement. What happened was he executed an amazing bucking storm and I could not stay on. So <laughs> that's really what happened. And I fell. Um, I couldn't breathe when I fell. I didn't know if it was a major inju- you know, injury. And a nurse that was at that clinic. And if you're listening, thank every nurse you know because this is what they do, especially in this time. She knew I was on the ground. She knew she would not socially distance if she came to me, and yet she did. She got off her horse, and she came to me, and she talked me through. Are you okay? Can you breathe? Can you move your – like, she just shifted into that healer. And I think it was such a great example of leadership in the moment, right? Yeah, that's fantastic. Speaking of leadership in the moment, leadership is in the moment right now. Again, word of the year, uncertainty. What do leaders need to do? What do leaders need to understand about empathy, about being a safe space or creating a safe space for failure that we haven't tapped into before? So what do they need? I'm one of the magic words on a Friday. (laughs) What they need to know is right now being human is more important than being the expert. Right now it is more important for you to try and try again. If you say something wrong, don't just let it hang there, right? Apologize, own that you said it wrong, but go ahead and say, I'd like to say that again. If you hear someone making that mistake, be brave enough to go, Would you like to say that again? What I'm seeing where leaders fall down right now is people that hold themselves out as an expert, right? They're trying to do so much bravado and so much, I know what to do. And then I look at them and I'm like, you are not 103. So you were not at the flu pandemic 100 years ago. It's okay to say, I don't know. Based on the data I have, this is what I can tell you right now. You know, as leaders, we can't always tell what's going on behind the scenes, right? We have confidentiality, but we can say, you know, Tanisha, I can't answer that for you right this second, but I give you my word the minute I can share, I will. And that will tell me something far more than going, Linda, Linda, you're being a little oversensitive, don't you think? Mm Mm-hmm. Because I don't know about you, but that's never calmed me down in the history of ever. Has <laughs> Linda calm down actually worked to calm me down? So Absolutely. does it work for you? Not, Not at, all. at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, <laughs> and that's so real. I think that we resort to these things. One of the things that I'm hearing is we've got to shift from a culture that says I've got to prove myself to looking to the goal or the focus being improving myself. And from that shift, it says that I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I'm going to make failures. And the failures are what leads to the improvement. And if we can look at it differently, then empathy lives in that place of continuous improvement, or it lives in that place of constantly saying, okay, I got to work on this, or I got to be better at this. And and you're going to fail forward in that place. So in this time of uncertainty, welcoming failure and allowing it a safe space for it. What are some other things that are, um, I guess, concepts or ideas or just things that people can be doing to, to, what are some other things that people can do now to help face uncertainty in addition to making a safe space for failure? I think you have to really sit down and have some self-awareness moments because, I mean, it happens to me. I laugh all the time. I'm like, I facilitate this, but it doesn't make me the expert at experiencing this. Absolutely. Right? So, but we have to be self-aware about how hard are you driving yourself? You know, I have people that are like, I'm ruining my child's life because I'm not homeschooling them correctly. And I'm like, how old are they? Three and a half. I'm like, <laughs> let them <laughs> play in some dirt. <laughs> right. But we weren't, I didn't go to school when I was three and a half. Right. So, and I'm not undermining their concern as a parent. I actually want to reassure them. You are doing pandemic just fine. It is okay that there is laundry in your laundry room. It is okay that your child's birthday party was a smash cake that you made, and it's not a Pinterest birthday party. It's okay that you ran away and sat by the lake last week with a hamburger because you needed to get out of the house. We're not 
normalizing that it's not normal, right? I'm not going to say unprecedented because that'll be an answer on someone's bingo card. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, we're just being flexible, adaptable, divine creatures like we have done for eons. Absolutely. We can do this. Absolutely. But we have to turn the perfectionism switch off. And then the other one you said was about inside of the work, we talk about hustling for your worth yes, versus standing in your value. Yes. Your value as a parent is in the love and the safety and the structure. It's not in your value to do, you know, math a new way. It's not in your value to <clears throat> buy the fanciest flashcards and teach your child to read. My mother has my very first flashcard. She can show it to all of you. And it is a cornflakes box. She I just took the tops off of cereal boxes and stuff. So my first words were cornflakes. So <laughs> that's what I read. That's fantastic. I have, um, we have a four-year-old and in working with, you know, homeschooling in a pandemic environment has been interesting to say the least. But one of the things that I think has helped me a great deal is she's four. Being able to write the letter A is going to come. She won't be 17 and unable to write the letter A. What's more important right now is that I foster a care, a love for learning, that I help them to see um, resilience and perseverance and that um, hard work can accomplish a lot of things. And then better defining what hard work actually is. I think that we have gotten askew on what hard work is and we've attached it to perfectionism. And so we've said hard work equals something that you can't actually even accomplish, which is causing so much of us to sit in that place of hustling for your worth. So I, I love that. And, and it's definitely something that I've seen in my own life that has been transformative in that, you know, I've been able to rest a little bit more in this experience by saying I'm human. And this is unknown and unknown is scary and it's OK that I'm scared. It's absolutely, it's not only okay, it's a good sign, right? It's okay to be conservative and, you know, look into the arena before you walk into it. You know, I'm not saying blaze up the stairs into the arena with no preparation, right? But it's also okay to go, I'm not going to be the best. And some days everything doesn't have to be an A. Everything doesn't have to be 100%. So if you're at work and you've got a big project that has to be 100%, Okay, the laundry can be at 75%. Absolutely. The, I'm cooking every meal from scratch and it's a perfectly, you know what? Order out, support the restaurant industry. Absolutely. So let other people help you. You know, I'm really focused on, you know, one, for those of you that have been on a state webinar will know that on every single one of them, I thank our state employees because I don't think people appreciate what y'all are doing. The things that just go unseen. Mm -hmm that are making my life better as a citizen in Oklahoma. So thank you for that. But we're not thanking people enough. Thank that cashier in the grocery store that is essential. Thank that nurse. Reach out to your friends on Facebook. And I mean the strong ones that you don't think need you. Mm -hmm. Send them the message, right? How are you doing? Say to your friends, how are you experiencing the world? That's good. That's good. The arena that... Uh, Linda is speaking about is is from the Dare to Lead work. And we went through that uh, with our team, and it is a fantastic experience. Uh, it was definitely something that um, our team found a great amount of value in. Um, it really did um, line up with what Linda said she's there to do, which is bring the curiosity and create the structure. Um, and it, it has equipped us with the ability to be a team that's a safe space for failing forward. What else would you say to our audience, to the leaders out there, to state employees about just what we need to do, especially for those of us who embrace this message, who hear it, but might not be in an environment that I can really live it out? How do I still reconcile that within myself to be okay to fail forward? Now, you know from being in that work with me, what I'm going to say to you about how do you stay in that work is stand in your values, mm -hmm. right? But we can model change. Sometimes we think, oh, if I can't turn the whole thing 180 degrees, then it's not worth it. But turning a boat, turning a ship takes a long time. 
So you don't know. Um, a friend of mine has a, a, a new project he's working on called The Ripple Effect, right? You don't know that what you say to me today doesn't make me go home and be a more empathetic human being to my spouse. Absolutely. So rather than go, I don't have this power to change that. I can't change Tanisha. I can't change Tom. But you know what? I can decide. And I have decided, right? Because I was not a person 10 to 12 years ago that centered empathy. I centered deliverables, getting it done, compliance, follow the rules, right? I could be really difficult to work for because I was like, what do you mean you need to go home because your kid has a soccer game? And that's not a happy way to live. And it's not how I wanted to lead. And I changed it. And I think that's something it's important for leaders to do as well. Mm -hmm. Instead of acting like I've always been this smart, this good, this experienced, this not afraid. Right now, what people trust is when you're vulnerable and you go, you know what? I don't know. We're going to try this. I'm unsure, but we'll try. Like before this, right? You and I said to each other, not sure how this will go. And you said, it's just a conversation. Absolutely. Right? You didn't say to me, Linda, I can't believe you're worried. You just were in it with me. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. It was a great example. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and that's empathy. Empathy says that even if I can't understand what it's like to be nervous about an experience, about, well, better statement, even if I can't understand what it's like to be nervous about this experience, I do know what it feels like to be nervous. And I think sometimes we look for it to be the same thing. I'm not concerned or afraid about X factor. So therefore, I don't know what it feels like to be concerned or afraid. I can't empathize with you because it's not about X factor. Right. But I do know what it feels like to be concerned and afraid. And that's where empathy lives. Exactly. So I'm kind of fond of saying it's, you know, empathy is not an event, mm -hmm. right? It's an emotion. And one of the reasons we run from it, and I have certainly run from it in the past, is that I don't want to feel those emotions. Absolutely. Right? If you have had a loss, if you have had a death, I don't want to think about the, the times I have buried someone I care about, right? If you have lost your job, well, the first thing I'm going to think about is times I've lost something was taken from me. Maybe I didn't lose a job, but something else was taken from me where I didn't get a vote, so feeling those emotions right now is part of why people are overwhelmed. Absolutely. You know, and we're, we're caregiving without self-caring, right? The flight attendants are right. Put your mask on first <laughs> and then take care of others. It's not being selfish. It's being prepared. Yes. It seems like this overarching theme in all of our episodes where it's that's the place where we have to start really redefining, reframing and shifting our paradigm about what it means to take care of others. And that in taking care of others, you have got to care for yourself. And I, I'm going to say this, removing it from the sensationalized self-care movement that says go get pedicures and manicures, which is a part of it, obviously. But it's so much more than that. It's a bigger thing than just cosmetic self-care or um, recreational self-care. It's about the emotional, the mental work. Self-care, and I don't think we talk about that because it's a little tricky. I think part of what's going on right now with people is it's it's so many emotions that are coming at you, but I I feel like they all have the same root cause, which is you know as as humans we go through a lot of our lives thinking that we're in control. Oh yes, and you know back back around January or February that control was stripped right away from every single one of us. Absolutely. And things were put in motion that we have absolutely no control over anymore. Uh, so I think for me, that's part of it is that illusion of control is gone <laughs> and it may, it may never come back, but I think that's what causes a lot of the stress for people right now. Absolutely. He said the C word. And they're going both directions with it, right? So people are either handling it really well, like just kind of staying loose and fluid and adaptable, or we've really kind of seen the control freaks 
rise up, and I say that as one of them. So uh, I have to be really Hi, careful. Linda. Right? Hello, my name is Linda. I'm a control freak. So I have to be really careful to not try and control the little things because the big things are on fire, right? And then pushing that out to other people. And I've seen it even on things with. I've seen leaders have their team on Zoom eight hours a day. So even if they're not meeting, just so they can see them. And I'm like, well, could you see them before? No. (laughs) What's this about, right? Right. What is your deep fear? Um, Well, they're not performing. Okay. The coach in me says, and what else? Right. Oh, that I'm missing things. Ah, now you're concerned about you're going to fall down because you don't know everything. And we can work on that. Absolutely. Right. I made a note while you were talking and before Tom did about self-care, um, because I think it even goes deeper because I the same thing. Right. Go buy a bath bomb, get your toes done and everything will be good. And what we do there is I think it's a form of privilege. Right. We're equating self-care to luxury. Yes. And what if my, I'm working two jobs? What if you know what? A, I can't go to the mall or I can't go buy that or I can't get a pedicure. Self-care for you might look like all your friends that said, can I help? Say yes. Let me send you dinner to your house if I'm more financially able to provide that. So self-care for you. Let me, you know, send my husband over to fix the gate so that you don't have to pay someone. Right? I think that we're misunderstanding how deep self-care can go. In both directions, I had a someone I know this week that received a disciplinary action because they didn't file for a piece of paper fast enough mm-hmm. when they got sick with COVID. And I'm like, what kind of leader wow. thought that was the priority right now, that you didn't quite follow a benefits process well enough um, as you were getting very sick with COVID? And that's what I'm seeing, right? That's a grab for power. Yes. Of, okay, everything's okay. I'm still in control. This is a process and you broke it. Rather than the empathy of, you know, with COVID, people go from, I was fine at 8 o'clock and now it's midnight and I'm having a hard time breathing. Mm-hmm. And in that four hours, I didn't think, oh, gee, let me fill out paperwork. Yeah. So does that kind of answer it? So I want to be really careful when we say self-care that we don't come at it from this place of privilege of just, hey, leave work early and go get a $50 pedicure and then go home and have a $30 bottle of wine. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Not my life. People are taking care of babies. People have multiple Mm -hmm. jobs. People don't have that disposable income. And they're the people we need to make sure we're reaching and lifting up. For some people, their time when they're at work is the calm part of their day. Absolutely. (laughs) It is. I mean, those are discussions I've had with people about, you know, when people are like, oh, you're so lucky to work from home. And yet for some people, they're at home with an abuser that they used to be able to leave and go to the office. So these are the things that I think that in the 1980s, my first jobs were in the 80s. For those of you listening, I'm 52. So uh, and my hair is still big. But... (laughs) My first jobs, they would say things like, you know, Linda, Linda, it's not personal. Linda, it's business. Don't take this so personal. But you know what? If you want to have a healthy culture, everyone needs to be taking it personally. Everyone needs to be self-aware. People that are like, I'm not my brother's keeper. Yes, you are. That's how we build an amazing culture. We're accountable for each other and we care for each other. Absolutely. I could not agree more. One of the things that I think about leadership, um, going back to the example that you gave uh, the the person who was getting ill with this very scary thing, who in their right mind could have possibly shifted to think? And I'm sure that there are some people out there who can, but I can't imagine the idea of shifting to think about making sure that a a, a T is crossed or an I is dotted in that moment. One of the things that I find, and it goes back to the control, it goes back to the thought that says that I got in, in, in a place of uncertainty. I've got to hold on to the reins as tight as I can because that's the thing that's 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 my defense. That's the thing that I can hold on to that's going to keep me safe. We're talking about aspects of psychological safety. Where I've seen this manifest in other times of uncertainty that aren't as major or not as widespread are leaders who, and I'm going to say this, and I don't need to clean it up, <laughs> who hyper focus on things like dress code and punctuality and attendance. I'm not saying these things don't matter, and I'm not saying we shouldn't focus on them, but what I am saying is that a leader, to me, 
um, one of the telltale signs for me of a leader that might be spiraling out or unsure and uncertain what to do is how hard and fast they stick to and attach to those very black and white areas of leadership and management because it's clear and it's something that I can attach myself to to feel in control or to feel like I'm doing something and I'm actually not doing very much at all. Right. It's usually the least value added thing we pick to hang on to, right? Absolutely. Like, let me pick the smallest thing with the least amount of return, but I can control it. Um, Like, this is one of those true confessions moment of when you're listening to this podcast, go ahead and just raise your hand to yourself. If you've ever put something on your task list that you already completed, just for the joy of marking it off so you could feel (laughs) effective and functional while everything else was on fire. Right. And that's a part I think of what you're saying Mm -hmm. is that that false sense of control and leading from compliance and control is a form of armor. This is the rule Tanisha. I can't change it Tanisha. Um, you know, this is just how we've done, this is how we've always done things. Oh, you said the state words. So, you know, Nostalgia is a thing, and honestly, I find that once I say, hey, I've got a flashlight, let's go look, people are more inclined to go than if I just berate them and go, why are you scared to go into the dark spot? Like Instead, I go, here's a flashlight. Mm -hmm. Let's go. We put the problem in front of us. Not what are you going to do about it? Yes. There was someone, and I don't remember who it was. It was in a a, a webinar that I did, and it was a, a comment in the chat, and they said, Oftentimes, it's like, and they're talking about the things that we fear, and it's like um, thinking that the the thing, spider, snake, is so much bigger until you actually get closer to it or you, in this case, shine the light on it, use that flashlight, and recognize that it's, oh, this is it? This is all? But sometimes what it takes is that other person, whether it's somebody who's already been down that path and they know, yeah, it's not as big as you think it is. Come on, let me show you. I'll be your flashlight or as a person who I've never had this experience, but I know what it feels like to be scared. Yes. And I'll walk with you and I'll be a flashlight as best as I can so that you can recognize it's not as bad as you think it is. Or even if it is, you got it. And I'm here with you to go through it. And someone usually taught us that when we were younger. And I hope that you had the experience, right? When the three-year-old, the four-year-old, the five-year-old calls out in the dark and they're scared, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us don't just slam the door and go, well, just suck it up. It's not personal. Let's just go to sleep now. We say, let me turn on a light. Where is the boogeyman? Oh, the boogeyman's under the bed. Do you want to look or do you want me to look? We actually get consent. And they're usually like, no, you can. (laughs) Right. Right. They have no problem with sending (laughs) us to deal with the boogeyman. And then you might look under the bed and then you might say, would you like to look too? Right. You now they have agency and empowerment. You might say, is there anywhere else you want me to look? You want to check the closet before I leave? But then we think this doesn't work with, you know, grown people. And it right. it does. If you just go, what are you nervous about? You know, whether it's the first time that promotion and you walk in that new office and we all go, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. They have picked the wrong person and sooner or later they'll figure it out, right? Like that's that voice of uncertainty yeah. helping us pre-grieve our failure. And telling us to stop. Say that again. Oh, look. Our voice of uncertainty helping us pre grieve our failure. Pre grieve our failure. Yes. Oh, you're going to sit with that for a second? Yes, that hit me. Keep going. (laughs) So let's talk about that because I, in the story of when I became a Dare to Lead facilitator, um, I followed Brene Brown's work for years for one reason she helped change my life. When I was making that transition from Empathy is weakness and trash, and I'm not doing it, to I'm going to focus my whole life around it. Um, Her vulnerability TED Talks, right? A lot of us came to the work that way and realizing, like, it's not that everyone doesn't work hard. It's that you're a ridiculous perfectionist. Mm -hmm. But when I applied to be a facilitator, even though I met all the qualifications, all of them, I still, in the 45 days between applying and and obviously being accepted, um, pre-grieved. She's not going to pick me. She means everybody else that meets these qualifications. She means the other people. And some people have heard me tell this story. So for 45 days, I didn't go, oh, how exciting. I didn't go ahead and maybe book a hotel room going, I'm going to get in. Right? All the stuff we're supposed to practice. I went going to be okay. You'll try next time. 
you know what? Other people will be good at it, and you'll go learn it from them. So when the email came in, if y'all were in this room, you would see Tanisha just like her face is shocked. Um, I would say her mouth's hanging open, but she's wearing a mask, and we're six <laughs> feet apart. So, But I'm pretty sure it's hanging open. It is. So for 45 days, that was the conversation. I was actually very kind to myself because we're kind when we're grieving. I'm like, it's okay. It'll be all right that she doesn't pick you. So when the notice came in and it said, obviously, congratulations, we'd like to welcome you, my ever helpful brain then said, holy cow, no one else applied. How lucky are you that Brene Brown scraped the bottom of the barrel? Anything but you're and worthy of it. Anything but you're worthy. My brain was like, hey, Linda Clark's a common name. You might want to check that it's the right Linda Clark. So all of this work, it's just a reminder that I don't care how good you are on any given day. You are five minutes from having a moment of, I'm an idiot. Yes. <laughs> right? And it's how quick do we recover? How quick are we resilient? How quick do we go, I don't need to listen to that random opinion. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's okay that I made a mistake. It's okay that I'm scared right now. Mm -hmm. It's okay that I'm trying to go outside and play and, and work and take care of myself. And sometimes I just want to close the door and hide. So probably a long answer to what you were asking, oh, but we phenomenal. sure jumped on the people don't think about pre grieving and we do right. Think about when you ask someone on a date, you pre grieved, right? You're like, okay, if they say no, it'll be all right. All right. I'll look down and act like it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, you, I know in my younger financial years, I have pre grieved not being approved for credit, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're like, okay, I'm going to turn this in. And you're like, okay, hit or miss. We'll right. see. But you know, later now it's like, I don't worry about it. Yeah. But that's a point of privilege too. Yeah. Right? So recognizing our privilege and how it shows up in these systems is so critically important to how we interact with people. That's fantastic. It it, it, it puts me in mind, I have a, a daughter who's a freshman in college this year. Woo, woo. Where's right? she going? She's at UCO. Woo, roll toes. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, she called me the other day and she says, I did, I turned in my homework assignment. Uh, but I don't know if I did it right. I emailed the instructor to find out if I did it right because no one else did it this way or no one else has turned it in yet. So I don't know if I did it correctly. And that's what it lends me in mind. She, and, and she did it fine. She did it perfectly. But because she had already kind of set it up that, like, if no one else is doing this or if it doesn't look like this, you know, then then that must mean I'm not right. And kind of following along those lines of, of, of pre-grieving so that we can defend ourselves from the hurt that doesn't even exist. We pre Oh, my gosh. I. That's going to change some things for me. I Yay. hope it changes some things for everybody who's hearing this, who's listening to this, because that is such a big deal. And I think the other thing is that we look at it like we have to be able to stop those thoughts. So, right, like once you get this revelation and it's, oh, I do that. I got to stop doing that. No, I'm not saying that's a, a fruitless goal. What I am saying is that the kinder, softer, gentler thing to do to ourselves is to recognize that it's there. It's going to be there. But then what you said and what I've been finding recently is follow it up, though. The energy that you have to expel to try to stop the thought and the way our brains are set up, these things have become automatic. Example I give is driving. I get places and I forgot how I got there, especially going home. <laughs> it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. These thoughts and these, this way of thinking, it's automatic. So the ability to override that is very, very challenging. It can happen, but it's a lot of work. In the meantime, though, following the thought up, being cognizant of the thought and following up with a additional thought or something else that says, okay, but you're, you're pre-grieving at this moment, or at this moment. Or one of the things that I've been working on currently, which is whenever I find that I'm not quite good at something, I think that all of us are at a place right now that we are, the doors are being busted open on the things that we've, that we're, that we struggle in, that we're not quite good at, that are our weaknesses that are being exposed, where we've been trying to keep them covered. We can't hide them anymore. And in doing these things, it's a yet. So the example that I have is audiobooks. 
Tell me about this because audiobooks and I don't get along. I'm like, I can't, I don't understand how you drive and listen to the book. So tell me Absolutely. about. Absolutely. This is where I am because I'm that person. I'm like, this doesn't work for me. But right now, just being 100% transparent and honest, I feel like I've reached the capacity of what my knowledge will give me. And I'm in a place where I've got to eat more. I got to learn more. I got to take more in. And that comes from reading, that comes from, you know, exposing yourself to different things, podcasts and those types of things. But where's the time? Where's it at? Like, I can't sit down. I have a, a, a seven-month-old at home. You heard I got a, a, a freshman in college, and, it, and the spectrum goes <laughs> all the way. There's more in between that. And there's not a lot of time. But I got to get this information. I got to grow. How other people are seeming to manage and multitask in this way are audiobooks. And I'm, the, I'm with you, Linda. Uh, that doesn't work for me. The way my attention span is set up, <laughs> I can't sit here and listen. But then what I started to do is yet. I can't sit here and listen yet. I can't focus yet. And I just have to keep doing it. And I've noticed that the more I do it, the better it gets. It's not perfect. And I think the other challenge is we are all or nothing. If I can't do it perfectly, I'm not going to do it at all. And, and removing that thought process and adding the yet has been the thing that's, that I'm like, okay, I'm getting it now. Have I had to rewind? Is <laughs> it taking me far longer to go through an audio book than I would like for it to? Yes. But am I getting more than what I would have gotten if I didn't do it at all? Yes. And so I'm just, and so the yet has made a difference for me in saying, this is something that I struggle with, or I've even said the statement, that's not me. I need a book. I need to have it. Ideally, yes. In a perfect world, that's what I would prefer. My world's not perfect. It's not set up that way. It's, but I got to get this thing done, so I have to shift the way I look at it. I love that idea. Um, so for me, what works is living my life in 15-minute chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you saw my desk, there's a cube on it, um, like hashtag Amazon, right? <laughs> but it's uh, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 30, and 60, and you just flip the cube to whichever one you need. And for me, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you think it's not that much time, but I can knock out a chapter of a book. I can fold a load of clothes that I might have thought was going to take 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you actually start walking around your house for 15 minutes, you'll be surprised what you can accomplish, right? And I actually got that habit. There was a website, and I haven't been on it in a while, so I don't know if it still exists, but flylady.net is a lady that taught people to kind of declutter their lives and clean mm -hmm. their houses, right? But she talks about 15-minute increments if you're tacking your garage, if it's gotten out of control, or that yeah. junk room in your house. Or instead of going, you must clean your whole house, she's like, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Grand Canyon was created 15 minutes at a time, Absolutely. right? Like water worked its magic. So don't underestimate. You know, when I when I talk with coaching clients and they go, I'll put aside two hours this weekend to read a book. I'm like, that didn't work in undergrad and it doesn't work now. None of us are we're going to get there and go, I don't have two hours of attention span. The baby needs something. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, I have the great fortune to work with HR professionals that are studying for their credentials and they often are like, when am I going to study? And I'm like, you need to study about four hours a week in addition to class. When am I going to find four hours? And I'm like, go to work 15 minutes early, take 15 minutes at lunch, stay at work 15 minutes late before you start your evening. That's 45 minutes a day, yeah. right? And we don't think of that. We go, I don't have 45 minutes. No, you don't. But you have three 10-minute pieces or three 15-minute pieces. Yeah. So micro learning is real. Micro experiences are real. And, and that's the trend. That's where we're yeah. moving into is, is micro learning. And it's so important that we understand that um, from a leadership perspective, from an HR perspective, from a learning and development perspective, uh, because this is where we are. And so we have to start adjusting to the needs of the people, of our customers, our clients, which is why micro learning is taking off, because I don't have six hours all the time to sit in a classroom and absorb this information, but I do have five. And I can get it that way. And the thought that I'm having when you're saying that is for those of you who might be listening and saying, 15 minutes is not very long. I couldn't, I couldn't even focus in 15 minutes. Well, my idea would be, because this is what I immediately thought, um, try to find a space and just sit there, turn on a timer, turn on a, a, a um, you know, on your phone, the, the stopwatch or whatever that looks like, and just do nothing for 15 minutes and see how long 15 minutes actually is. If you can actually sit there and do nothing. Now, I'm sure there's some of you out there who can, and I'm, I envy you. <laughs> but 
try to do nothing for 15 minutes and genuinely see how long that really is and that you have a lot more available to you than you think, it's, again, shifting the way we've always allowed ourselves to see it and think of it, which if I could say anything, uh, I try to find a positive in, in everything. A gift from this time period is the ability to really start to see things differently. It, it was it was an abrupt, you know, shock that said, look at it differently. And, and, and I think that the people who have been able to adjust in that place and say, how else can I see this? How else can I look at this? What else could I be doing? Um, where before we had situations where leaders, companies, organizations, individuals were saying, I can't do that or that will never work. And now we've had to adjust to those very things we said we couldn't do or and or were impossible. So a gift from this experience has been all the examples of how innovative, how creative, how really healthy we can become if we're just willing to see things a little differently. And I totally agree with you there. Um, one thing that's sitting heavy on my heart as we talk about it being a gift is also talking about the families that have, have, have had loss, the Absolutely. families that have experienced, you know, the pain of not only COVID, but the social justice issues that yes. we're experiencing and how that's coming forward. And that is there always a miracle and a gift in the greatest pain? Yes. But I also want to be sure that we're centering those experiences that have allowed some of us to feel Absolutely. the gifts, right? Yeah. Uh, what I can guarantee is it's probably won't be the only and last time that you are. <laughs> so, Linda, I mentioned earlier about learning to drive, right? And the the way that we um, start off, you have to really focus in on it. But now we can get places and you don't even remember how you got there. And you related that to mindfulness. Talk to me about that. So I, I did because, you know, let's tackle what is mindfulness, because I think some practices make it such a difficult achievement, right? When people say you'll spend your whole life learning to meditate. And that sounds insurmountable to me. So I'm like, well, then I don't want to do it. Absolutely. And then when we try to meditate, you know, I picture I need to be under this tree and I'm super ascended and my brain's like, pay the electric bill and do you hear the dog? <laughs> and so it doesn't count. But inside of... Kristen Neff's work about mindfulness has been powerful for me, but also the Eastern text around the Tao Te Ching, right, or the Tao and the concept of presence. You know, if you go read those, you know, I don't want to use the word scriptures, but those texts, right, they talk about in order to know balance, you must know both extremes. They talk about the house is not as what, what is useful. It is the empty space inside of the house, which is how we make a home. So all of these texts on mindfulness, but when I'm working with clients one-on-one -on -one that are driving to work and don't know how they got there, right? One of the best places to learn mindfulness is in the car. Don't start trying mindfulness with your toughest emotional situations, right? Don't. Start, that's like going to get your doctorate and you went without an undergrad degree, so you're not prepared. I honestly start people while driving. You know, notice that is a blue Lexus in the next lane. That tag is from Texas. Oh, look at the new building, right? We went north on May the other day, and I was like, I didn't even know this stuff was here. <laughs> so I encourage you in mindfulness, it's not about attaching judgment to the situation. It's not, there's a blue Lexus. I hate Lexuses. My ex-boyfriend drove a Lexus, and now you're down the rabbit hole of your ex-boyfriend. Right. It's just, there's a blue Lexus. It's not good. It's not bad. Nothing. Just be in that moment, right? I am speeding or I am not speeding. I am going slow and I'm in the left lane. I would like you to now change lanes if you're that person, <laughs> right? But, you know, and this is a great way to do with your children, right? Like what, hey, what do you notice while we're in the car? Mm -hmm. Children can reteach us mindfulness because they notice that Everything. there's six cows in the pasture and they see the shiny red car. So... Allow children to teach you to be mindful again because it's adulting that taught us not to be mindful, and we can unlearn this. I love that because it's so true. And how many of us who have small children or have had small children or been in the car with a small child that's like, oh, look at the – and they have a 100 questions every mile right. <laughs> about what they see, and we don't see any of it or we're, we're too consumed – yeah, your attention brain is to mad, it. right? Your brain's like, shut up so I can plan this meeting that I didn't do because I had to sleep last night. 
Yes. And hopefully you don't say it, right? Because sometimes we yell, right? Moms aren't perfect. Dads aren't perfect. Sometimes you're just like, can we just be quiet for a second? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. There's, when you talk about the idea of finding balance, going to the extremes, I love that. I think that, um, I, you know, it's just one of those things that I've been noticing that we do. We realize there's something that we have to work on or I, I have a thing and I go to the other end of the spectrum. I go all the way on the other side to try to address it. Um, and that's just another extreme. But you do kind of have to learn that to find what that middle looks like. I think the challenge is, though, that when we're in those extremes, unless we understand that the goal is the middle, the balance, then we function from this very binary place, yes. this this place that says it's either this or that. So it's interesting because you mentioned something earlier and I scribbled a note about binaries. So um, my coach and y'all, I, I can't tell you this enough. And you and I talked about it on the break that I don't believe in coaches that don't have coaches. I wouldn't go to a therapist that isn't experiencing therapy. So I don't want to go to a yoga instructor that doesn't believe they also have a yoga practice. Mm -hmm. Right. So my coach is Stacy Jordan Shelton. And one of the things she talks about is we have to throw out the binaries. Mm -hmm. Right. We decide employees are good or bad. Everyone has a strength. And if you can't see it in someone, you can't coach them. Mm -hmm. And maybe their success is just not with you. It's another department. It's another agency. It's another line of work. So, you know, people are like, you've been in HR your whole life. I guess it doesn't bother you to fire people. And it's like, first of all, if it ever stops bothering me, I've lost the human aspect. Absolutely. However, bothering me doesn't mean I feel guilty about it. Mm -hmm. If I know you had the training, I know you were coached, I know you had the opportunities and you elected not to participate in your success, then I am your fiercest cheerleader for being successful elsewhere. So we're going to have a tough conversation and separate because I want you to be with the employer that's best for you. I want you to go open your own business if that's where you really should be, right? So that's how we balance these things. Mm -hmm. I still have tough conversations. I still have standards, but I don't live in that binary of, you know what? Your PowerPoints suck. Therefore, you're a bad person. Like, well, okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> right. You're not good at PowerPoint and you're a good person. Do we need to send you to a PowerPoint class? Or you know what? Maybe you don't need to be doing your PowerPoints. Maybe someone else can do it, and they're awesome at it. And then none of us have to feel bad. We can be strengths-focused, right? But until I got out of that binary, and we're seeing the binary in social justice, when as a white person moving through the world, I said to a black friend in a moment of complete stupidity, oh, I understand exactly what you're going through. <laughs> Right. And you can laugh and we can have this uncomfortable silence. And then I went, I am so sorry. There's no way I can know your experience. I know tough situations and I'm feeling those, but I can't say yours. So because I was mindful, I was able to realize I had stepped in it. And then because I believe in service and courage, I could correct myself instead of how many times do we go, that wasn't the best thing I could have said. Maybe they didn't notice. Right. I just won't say anything else and we'll all just have an awkward pause and move on. Right. But we have to do that, right? That's a binary. The binary of gender. When we go, there are men and there are women and people that are gender non-binary, gender fluid, gender non-conforming are like, hey, what about me? Right. You know, I identify as a woman, but I present masculine or I'm transgender or, you know, I'm cisgender and I know what that word means. <laughs> These are the conversations we're having now, right, that are way outside of the binary. And COVID has forced us into those places. There is no binary for I'm qualified to talk about COVID and you're not. Like, neither one of us is. Absolutely. So we can now play out in a range of who's qualified, where's the science, right? Right. So. Right. I love that. I, I do. And I think that it's so. So thank her because, boy, she just. As a coach, she just like, you're in the binary, Linda, you're in the binary. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm in the binary. And yeah. she, she pushes me out of it. So it's good work. It, it, and, the, and that's present in so many things. We talked earlier, and you gave this awesome example about the kid. Um, For not having kids, I got some good examples <laughs> around them, right? Fantastic. But I have great nieces and nephews and cousin kind of action. So. <laughs> so like the with the kid and the boogeyman or the monster under the bed situation and really played out. Um, what it 
is a healthy way of addressing that, right? Getting the kid involved, giving them choice and autonomy, allowing them to uh, uh, participate in the discovering or in the unveiling or the exposing of the thing that they're afraid of and walking with them in it. And then saying, like, we still as adults need that same journey. I think, though, one of the thoughts that I was having when you were saying that is, boy, that wasn't my experience. And I can imagine that there are a number of our listeners, a number of our audience or people who will listen to this and say, that wasn't it for me because I got told, you better just go to bed or there's nothing under there, go lay down type situation. I think what I would say to that, though, is that oftentimes what we do in those situations is that we didn't get what we needed. So therefore, we don't give what's needed. That's a choice. And that's another binary situation. We perpetuate what we know and do. We perpetuate what we know and do. So from a leadership perspective, from a parenting perspective, whatever that dynamic looks like, when I can identify and recognize that I didn't get the thing, but I know the thing that I should have gotten, instead of seeing it from the place that just says, I didn't get it and I didn't need it and I turned out fine, which probably isn't 100% true, (laughs) but... uh, then therefore, you know, I didn't get anybody coming and pulling me up or I didn't get anybody coming holding my hand and I just had to suck it up and take it. And therefore, that's how you lead other people. It's counterproductive. You needed something different that would have made you stronger, that mm-hmm. would have made you healthier. Give the thing that you needed, whether or not you got it. Absolutely. And to me, that's empathy. It is. And we talk about with self-compassion, talk to yourself like you would talk to someone you love. Absolutely. Right? And like, I love this team, right? And y'all, I've talked to you one-on-one and as a group where I go, hey, how are you self-harming? Hey, how could you be kinder to yourself? Mm -hmm. But then when it's my brain, slacker, why can't you work harder? (laughs) You know, it's like, whoa, 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 talk to yourself like someone you would love. You know what? It's okay that it's Friday and you're tired, Mm -hmm. right? I can be excited about doing this podcast, but I can also be excited this week is ending. Absolutely. So we can have these things that might seem counterintuitive of, I love that I'm here with you. And I will also love when I go right to the next step, but that's being in the moment and the, I get to rather than have to. And I agree with you, like not everybody had that growing up. And I think I said, I hope that you had this because Mm -hmm. I know someone listening to this didn't have the bed. There was no boogeyman under the bed because there was no bed. Absolutely, The bed might have been in the car and the person was in the front seat. So I want to be super sensitive to not appearing um, ableist financial privilege, you know, white privilege. Um, Those are there. Right. But the ideal is that someone didn't say suck it up and just be there in the dark with the boogeyman and it'll be fine and create night terrors, right? Or create other problematic behaviors because you just wouldn't be empathetic to the fear. You didn't want to talk about the fear. You didn't want to sit in the fear with me. So you just left me in it. Mm -hmm. And believe me, my brain will remember that. Yes. My brain will remember that. Yes. And for those of you listening who might be thinking like, what does this have to do (laughs) with... Uh, you know, business or, or, or leadership, it has everything to do with it. Because what we're describing is is a, a, a um, analogy that involves children, that involves, you know, that childhood experience of being afraid and something that's classic to children to be afraid of. It doesn't change for us as adults. We're functioning in a place of fear. The uncertainty and the existence of it has brought on fear. And we have to learn how to be kind to each other from this place of fear and to give grace and to allow failure and to make the safety, the psychological safety, the space for the failure so that the fear doesn't have to continue to reign in the way that it has been. Be afraid and do it anyway, right? Like, because we will catch you because I will be with you. I will have your back, right? Not just be afraid. Good luck, right? That's, that's different. Um, One of the things I tend to say, and my horse's trainer and I keep threatening to make tank tops out of it, is fear less, two words, fear less, period, stubborn more, Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm going to stand back up from it. I'm just going to do it. It doesn't mean I'm not scared, right? Whatever you see me doing, public speaking or whitewater kayaking or riding a draft horse the size of a house, it's not that I'm not scared. It's that I'm going to do it anyway, Mm -hmm. The parallel to that inside of the dare to lead work, you know, we talk about you can't get to courage 
without rumbling with vulnerability. We, if we don't have these tough conversations, if I don't say, here's what I'm scared about. I'm scared I'm not a good leader. I'm scared I don't know a strategy for recovering in this environment. I'm scared I don't know how to tackle um, workforces that work from home. I'm scared that I don't know how to build cohesion in a team. If we don't say those things, right, then we are still that child in the dark that's just afraid of the boogeyman and there's no help coming because we didn't ask. We don't. People don't know. Like share that you're scared. And when people share that they're scared, don't mock them. Don't tell them how you're better than them. Don't anything except I've been scared too. Thanks for sharing it with me. And then for me, the next step is because if someone came to me and they're, I'm scared, I don't know how to manage X, Y, Z. If I have experience, if I have an idea, if I've read something, if I heard something, if I've seen something from my lens that could be useful for that person, I then have that opening and that opportunity to share that with them and possibly provide a need or participate in the innovation that's going to contribute to the solution of, that they're seeking. But if people don't have the opportunity to say, I have a weakness or I have a hole or I have a need, then innovation gets stifled. It does. We just get shut down, right? I've absolutely been told, you know, sit down, wait your turn. When it's your turn, you know, just just come, but don't participate. You know, it's not time yet. You're still too whatever, yeah. right? Don't, don't do that. Now, it's okay to say this is a learning opportunity. Like the first time I take someone to a board meeting, I don't want them to have an issue that haunts them for a long time. So I might say, hey, come to the board meeting. Let's see how a board works. Let's look at the deck that we give to a board. Let's look at how we talk to a board. And you don't have to be in fear at all because you're not going to talk or present. You're just here to learn and absorb. And then next time, maybe you'll have a small piece and you'll talk and I'll be right here with you. Um, You know, one thing I do, uh, my background is in HR. And one of my giveaways as an HR person, when I'm coaching a manager, maybe I'm in the room with them and they're having a tough conversation and this works on Zoom too. I will tell the leader to take their pen and just fidget with it in their fingers. If you're listening to this, just pick up a pen or a pencil and fidget with it like you normally would. And I'm like, hey, if you need me, just set that pen down. And I will come right into the conversation. I will back you up. I will say the next step because I'll know what you've forgotten or you're worried about saying wrong. But you know what that pen does? It lets them go as hard and as long as they can go until they need help. I'm not guessing. I'm not interrupting them and making them feel challenged. We are truly collaborative in that moment. And even on Zoom, I can see them set down a pen and I go, okay, they're in trouble. Here comes comes the rescue. I love that. It's a cool clue instead of me going, do you need some help now? Yeah. Because everyone's answer is no. Leave me alone. Yeah. I got this. You right? have to save face in that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. So that's a secret giveaway for how you can collaborate with little tiny things like that to help people. out. And just like that, we're all going to be watching for pins now. Yeah, you're all watching for pins. It'll <laughs> have to be something else, right? But, but, the, but definitely being looking for those things. Mm-hmm. Linda, it has been... Such an experience and such a pleasure being able to have this time with you. Anytime I get to talk with you, it is a, um, really, I'm going to say this and sound very cliche possibly, but it's a life-changing experience. I always take away something I'm like, this is going to carry with me. And I am so grateful for that. Let our listeners know how they can reach you, how they can engage with you, how they can get some Linda in their life. So, you know, the best way, because when I'm listening to a podcast or a book or whatever, and I don't, I'm diagnosed ADHD. So when people go, and you can email me at and call me at and LinkedIn me, I'm already like, I don't even know what you just said. So how do you get in contact with me? Text follow, F-O-L-L-O-W, to 66866. I'll put you on my newsletter list. That'll get you contact info. Um, I'm not a believer in spam, and I'm not that person that's going to email you, market you into the ground. Um, actually, my communications and marketing manager gets mad at me because we don't do enough. So one to two emails a month. But that is honestly the best way. So that's text follow, F-O-L-L-O-W, 266866. Nothing to it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much again, Linda, for taking out the time to be here, to share your insights, to share some of you with us, with our listeners. 
Um, for those of you who have not had an experience of hearing Linda facilitate um, in some of the statewide learning service webinars, look into that. Until next time, because there will be a next time where we have Linda at the table to join us and just share her thoughts and, and, and to engage further in the conversation of how we can be better versions of ourselves. Thank you so much. Like, I am better for knowing this team, too. So this is just a mutual love fest moment. Um, thank you for having me. Thank, thank you for what you do for our state in your roles and to the state team and people associated. Thank you for your hard work that you're doing in every department that you're in. Um, I see you and I love you and I appreciate that you give me a great state to live in. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Oklahoma LinkedIn Learning Program, bringing on-demand training courses to all state employees. Until next time, keep on learning.